Hello everyone, welcome to the Butterfield Alpacas and Fiber Arts Podcast. I am Tasha Butterfield, alpaca rancher, crochet instructor, knitter, beginner, spinner, all kinds of wonderful things you can do with fiber. I, I love the fiber arts and I also love alpacas, which is why I do this podcast. And I have a number of new subscribers since the last episode. This is episode 10, by the way. The last episode, unfortunately, was seven weeks ago. By the time this episode is released, it would have been seven weeks since the previous one, and that was really not my intention. I'll get into that in a moment, but I want to welcome all my new subscribers. We have hit over 500 subscribers. Yay! Very exciting, um, and I want to thank all of my returning viewers. You are so faithful and so wonderful. This, the viewers I have for this podcast are just amazing. I, I want to tell you, you are amazing, and you just blow me away uh, with all of your support and with all of your questions, all of your interest. And for those of you who are new to this podcast, this is really meant to be a bridge between the alpaca industry. Uh, specifically in the United States and the fiber artists that use the materials from alpacas, specifically yarn. Um, I was a crocheter and a knitter first before I became an alpaca owner and I have had alpacas for five years. I'm going into my sixth summer. <laughs> now I'm in my sixth summer. So I've experienced a number of things. I'm here to share with you some of my successes and my mistakes. For those of you looking into alpaca ownership to kind of give you a realistic perspective of what it's like and for those of you who are fiber artists and admirers of alpaca this is to give you an insight as to what it takes to actually get alpaca yarn to you or alpaca end products of any kind you can find me on social media on facebook there is a specific facebook page for the butterfield alpaca ranch I like to post there often and every once in a while I do Facebook lives. Um, I'm also on Instagram. Facebook and Instagram are the best places to stay connected with me in between podcasts. That's where um, I post as regularly as I can or I share things uh, specifically on Facebook if there's something related to the fiber arts or alpacas I will share it there. Instagram is just like what's going on in my life, but those are the two best places to stay connected. Uh, but I'm also on Twitter and on Etsy. I do have an Etsy shop for all of my alpaca products. Some of you have bought products from me and I'm so, so grateful. And you have left just amazing reviews on um, my Etsy shop. So I thank you very, very much. And finally, there is a Ravelry group for this podcast. The link is going to be down in the description box along with all the show notes. So the show notes I include on YouTube with the video. You don't have to go anywhere else for those. It will list the timestamps at the top for all the different segments within this episode so you can skip around to watch the parts that you want. And anything I refer to that has a website or some type of link, I will include it down below in the notes as well. In the Ravelry group, there will be a separate thread for the notes. So if you'd rather communicate and connect over in Ravelry, that is where you're going to want to be posting. Or else you can just leave a comment down on this video. We have also had an alpaca cow over the last couple months. And unfortunately, most of the time during the cow, I have not been podcasting. But a number of you have participated in the cow and have already finished your items, which is super, super exciting. Um, for those of you who don't know, we did an alpaca cow starting June 1st. It goes through August 1st. So by the time this episode is released, it'll be nearly done. There will be a week left. And the whole idea was to get people working with alpaca yarn, knitting or crocheting. And the yarn had to be at least 70% alpaca. The other 30% could be some other type of fiber. And back in, was it episode seven? Um, I talked specifically about how to make choices with alpaca fiber, choosing the yarn and choosing a project. Because alpaca is not good for everything. 
Uh, you need to know the specifics of it to make really good choices. And if you don't know those things yet, go over to that episode and take a look. And I want to apologize to all of my faithful viewers who have missed out on new episodes of this podcast. And by the time this episode is released, it would be seven weeks since the previous episode. Uh, episode nine featured my grandmother's. Uh, really didn't intend to take a break this long. I thought it would be maybe a couple of weeks. And instead, it turned out to be nearly two months. Well, shearing took nearly three weeks. And then there was breeding before and after that. Um, Midsummer Fest in Chicago was in the middle of all that. And I still had family here. Actually, just a few days ago, I had family leave, come in, leave. And I needed time to recover from all that. <laughs> I also went to um, a class called Practical Fiber Sorting, which I will talk about in a future episode about how to sort alpaca fiber and determine what that fleece is best used for, what it is best to become, what end product. And that was awesome. That was a couple weekends ago. And yeah, so it's just kind of been a whirlwind of stuff. Again, I apologize for not releasing an episode sooner. It just, it just didn't come together. So now we're going to be back on schedule and doing weekly podcasts. I have a number of weeks topics all set up, some footage already shot for all that stuff. Today's episode is going to be about shearing. <sighs> Lots of shearing happened and I learned a lot of things this year having sheared my entire herd of over 30 animals. So today we're talking a lot about shearing. I'll also share with you in TB Strings and Things what I've been doing over the last couple of months in my personal um, fiber craftsy creation stuff. Uh, but for the most part, we're talking about shearing. I wanted to fill you in on some things that have been happening at the ranch since the last episode. There have been a few changes outside of the shearing, which changed everybody. But I have a couple of new members of my herd. First of all, Belle is in a new home. She's only just, uh, I think, about 10 miles from the ranch right now. She went to a place where she now has a boyfriend, and she's going to be a mama next year. Her and her boyfriend are very well suited, so, so cute together. They're both small, and they're both dark brown surreys, and I think she'll be, or is, very happy in her new home. And I did a trade. In exchange, I got Lucy. And Lucy is a Surrey Llama. She is three years old and she is beautiful. I wanted another girl Llama and I use Llamas as guards for my alpacas. I needed another girl to um, be able to separate the girl groups. Um, now that I did breedings, I'm preparing for babies to be arriving next year. And I need to do, needed to be able to split out the girls into two groups. So I needed two female llamas. And now I have Lucy. The other new addition to the herd came because Spider went to a new home as well. Did another trade and Spider went off to a Surrey boy farm, basically. Um, went to a place where they only have boys, or at least that. It was a couple that was changing their business model to only have boys um, and they were a Surrey farm and they still have all Surreys so Spider went over there he really needed to be in a place where he was not allowed to be a bully um, and I had some friends willing to take him on they knew him from uh, the previous owner they had had him before when he was much younger so they were willing to take him on, and in exchange, I got their last girl. Her name is Val, and she came with a two-week-old baby. Take a look.
Now this last exchange happened just a couple of days ago, so Val is still settling in, but she's very happy to be with a herd of girls. She blended right in, she's staying with the herd, she's making friends, and she's a really good mom. She's a really good mom. And that little boy, he is darling. You're gonna see a video of him later in this episode, but he is just so precious. And he's actually on the small side when it comes to baby alpacas, which we call Krias, C-R-I-A is the name of a baby alpaca. And he's actually on the small side in size, but super, super cute. He doesn't have a name yet. So maybe by the next episode, he'll have a name. <laughs> You already know that this episode is going to be about shearing. Most of it's going to be talking about shearing. But in the future episodes, like next week, I'm going to talk about breeding, um, which is another big thing that happened over the last few, or say a few weeks, longer than that. But since the last episode, breeding was another big thing that I did. And a number of you had questions about kind of the breeding process and pregnancies and that type of thing having to do specifically with alpacas. So I'm gonna go into more detail about breeding and talk to you about why I chose to pair a certain boy with a certain girl um, and kind of the things that we need to do to make sure that pregnancy takes place and kind of the differences of how we breed as owners how we choose to breed versus other types of livestock so that'll be next week's episode and then in the future future episodes beyond that I do want to talk about what happened at Midsummer Fest back in June that was my very first vendor event and I haven't talked about that on an episode yet so I want to cover that to kind of show you what it was like and the good and the bad what I learned through that experience since it was my first time being a vendor and vendor events that I have done since then and will continue to do um, by the time that episode comes up. So there are some of you who have products that you're wanting to sell or you're wanting to get into alpacas, you're most definitely going to have to have some type of way to sell the products made from your animals. If you're going to make money off of them and they're not just pets, they're pets totally different thing but if you're getting into alpacas to make money okay you need to sell the products that are made from them so we're gonna talk about that and also in a future episode sorting alpaca fiber I went to a class a couple weeks ago where I learned more about that so by then hopefully I'll have a lot more experience under my belt and we could talk more about that today being shearing the next step after shearing is sorting and that's a whole subject all on its own and it's very important for fiber artists to understand that and some of the jargon that we use in the alpaca industry so that you understand what labels on alpaca yarn really mean when they use certain terms what that really means so that will all be in future episodes now let's finally get into shearing First, let's talk about why we actually shear. Yes, we shear them to get the fiber off so that we can make products from that, but it's actually not the primary reason. The primary reason is for their health. These animals are susceptible to heat stress. They're from the Andes Mountains where it's significantly cooler than many places in North America where they now live. And I'm speaking just from a North American perspective with this. Um, even Australia or Europe where you'll also find alpacas now. The environments are quite different from where alpacas have lived for 6,000 years which is in the Andes Mountains of South America. They had adapted to that environment and so anything over say 80 degrees Fahrenheit can cause some stress on them. And you'll see in a video uh, later in this episode of their nostrils flaring simply because they're hot. So for the health of the animal, we need to get the fiber off of them. Now the fiber, I've talked about this in a previous episode, but it's extremely warm. Some studies have shown it to be up to six times warmer than wool. It definitely is warmer than wool and studies have shown different 
how many times warmer, <laughs> but some studies have shown up to six times. So you can imagine if they have that growing all of their body, that if they're out in say 100 degree heat, like today in my area is 100 degrees, that is just too warm. It would seriously put their body under stress and actually threatens their life. 100 degrees actually threatens our life, so you can imagine an animal that grows fiber that is like wearing a down coat. If you're wearing a winter coat in 100 degrees, you're not going to feel very good either. So our primary reason is to get them comfortable for their health, because then they can endure these extreme temperatures. There are strategies that we use like watering them down and fans and cooler, like shady places. We make sure that there are ways in which they can cool themselves down and I actually go in the heat of the day to do my chores simply so I can water them down. They need the relief. For me it would be easier to go in the morning when it's nicer, but that doesn't help them in the afternoon when it's way hot. So um, shearing them for their health and of course to get the product off, the fiber off to make to make it into product. So there's certain ways in which we shear. There are parts of the animal that are more desirable than others. And I have a video here showing you <laughs> me shearing this year. Some of you know I shear myself. This is the second year that I'm doing it. And I wanna say if you are a new alpaca owner or looking into owning alpacas, you don't want to shear yourself right from the start. And in fact, you may never end up shearing your animal. It's not mandatory. It's not essential that you yourself shear your alpacas because there are crews that travel the country every spring. Seriously, they, they travel all across the country and they'll come to you and they'll shear your animals very quickly, efficiently, professionally, and they'll look very nice. And I did that for the first three years. I think it was the first three years. And then I started acquiring, well, I had been acquiring more and more animals. And I knew that with my business model, my business plan, those numbers were just going to increase. So it got to the point where in order to save money, I needed to be shearing them myself. So at this point, I'm self-taught. I haven't taken a class on this or learned from a professional. I will be doing that next year, however. I, I will be taking a class. Um, so the challenges that I still have with shearing, hopefully I will be working those out and I will just be better. I will just be better. And I really want to be better because I want to be fast um, so that there's less time in which the animals are in a stressful situation. And of course, I get more done in less time, which is better for me. So what you're going to see is footage of me sharing one of the alpacas, and I'll just do commentary on the screen for you.
as I've said before, I am an amateur shearer, and you can tell by the result of the animals that I am an amateur. <laughs> now, compared to last year, they look a lot better. Certainly by the time I got to the end of shearing this year, I'd gotten a lot better. Um, no, and my stamina got a lot better too. Initially, I could do at max three in a day. Um, it's very taxing on my body. And in a two week period, I think it was 10 of those 14 days I had sheared. And by the end, I think we did seven in a day. Yeah, and it really helped that um, at least for the majority of those days, I had at least one other person that could shear. So we started alternating back and forth. So not all the work was laid on one person. But I did want to show you close up some of the tools that we used. So the main tool here is the actual shears and they're pretty big. I do have a smaller one um, from another brand. I think they tout a third less weight than this one. This one's pretty heavy. I didn't weigh it, but I mean, you build your arm muscles by holding this and doing, doing this. <laughs> But okay, so you, you get used to that. And I wanted to show you this here. This is not super clean. I haven't super cleaned it yet for the year. Now, there's two blades that go on here. This is called a comb. And these vary. This one here, it was towards the end of my batch. So I guess I should have got the other one that I really wanted, but there's little lifters on some, let's hold like this, okay. There's little lifters on this part of the comb, my favorite ones that I like to use, because what that does is lift this comb up just a little bit off of the body so that we're not shearing too, too close to the alpaca. Um, and that's really important on alpacas that have light colored skin, the pink skin, because or else they tend to sunburn. Now, thankfully, I've not seen that on any of my alpacas. I haven't seen um, sunburn. I have seen it on llamas, though. Llamas are not as dense in the fiber that they grow, so they are, at least mine, are more susceptible to that. So the comb is what rests against the body. And then we have the blade here, this little not this part, this part. <laughs> if I plugged it in, you'd see it. I don't want to plug it in. <laughs> okay, so this part goes back and forth. You can see the channel here that it travels on. It goes back and forth, um, and that's what actually cuts the fiber. And this moves very fast, as you can imagine, um, to cut all the fiber. And the finer the fiber, the harder this thing has to work, because that means those fibers are smaller and there's more of them growing in a small space. Um, if you remember me talking about follicles back in the episode where we talked about alpaca fiber for our projects, okay, you can imagine all those follicles on a fine fiber growing animal, there's just a lot of it. And the, the blades and the combs get dull as they go through all the fiber. So they have to be changed on a regular basis. Um, and this, these, I kind of clean these up, but by the time you're done, there's just little bits of fiber all over the place. You can see down in here how dirty that is. I get it to focus on that for you. It's not focusing on it. I'm trying to get in front of my face, it's not focusing on me. Don't focus on me. All right, I don't think it's focusing, but anyway. Uh, you have to clean this on a regular basis. You saw me putting oil in, there's, let's see, there's a dot here, you see a dot here, and there's a dot here. That's where I'm putting oil. And then I also have this spray that um, helps it to cool down and also stay oiled. Other tools that you saw me using I know, they look super scary. Like Edward Scissorhands or something. <laughs> so 
So these I got this year because uh, previously we were just using scissors and you saw me using them um, to trim up areas that like the head or the armpits or around the tail. Um, places that I was not comfortable getting too close to with this. And like I said, in past years, we've used scissors, but scissors get dull and they uh, actually kind of wear out your hand pretty fast. So I bought these. And these are what people used to shear with all the time before the electric shears. These are traditional shears. But let me tell you, they work. They work so well. They cut so nicely. You get a long um, space that it covers. And I know that they look scary. People who are helping me out, um, when there was a spot that they just kind of want to take scissors and, and kind of help trim out things, they're very intimidated to use these. But once you kind of get over the intimidation factor, you, you, uh, you realize how nice they are. So on ones like even Sophie, no, you haven't met the alpacas yet, the end result. Okay, that's coming up. You'll see Sophie and the way that I had to shear her, I just use these. Okay, but I have a nice holster for them so they don't poke anyone as they're laying down. They just stay like this. I also have a sharpener for them, so that's something that I need to do now in the off season. And then the other thing that we do while they're restrained, um, a couple of things actually, we do their toes, alpaca toes, um, they have padded feet and actually nails on their toes. And those nails grow out regularly like our toes would. But that means that they need to be trimmed up regularly too. So this one some of you may find familiar. They kind of look like garden shears. Um, but they're also the same shears that you would use on sheep or goats or like um, other live, small livestock. Some of you might have a pair of these for something that you have in your life. Um, I don't think I did a close-up of doing their toes because that really wasn't the point today. And yeah, so we trim up their toes with this. We also check their teeth. Um, I don't yet have the tool to actually grind the teeth down. Some of them need it. Um, but their teeth grow constantly as well. Some of them grow faster than others. Just Mostly it's genetics, some of it's age, but at shearing time, we also check the toes and the teeth. So that's what we did, um, and we also give shots if they need to. Since they're restrained, all those things are a lot easier to do. Um, and so sometimes, some of those animals only get their toes and teeth done once a year. And for, I think, the majority of them, that's totally fine, but there are instances where the toes more so than the teeth, but the toes need to be done maybe a couple of other time, a couple other times during the year, and the teeth, a couple of mine probably need um, a touch up during the year as well. But typically, they all get it done once a year. Now I want to show you what the herd looks like after shearing. They are quite different, so let's go on out to the ranch. Hi everyone, welcome to the ranch. Today I'm going to reintroduce you to my herd. First of all, we've had a few changes since the very first episode when I introduced you, but also they've been sheared so they look quite different, especially some of them almost unrecognizable. And if you've never seen the difference in an alpaca pre-shear, post-shear, then you're really gonna see something special. Let's start with these guys over in the corner. Now I just got here and it's a really hot day. I haven't watered anyone down, so you're going to see some of them that are um, pretty hot, but I'll take care of them in a moment. So the white one in front here chewing his cud, isn't that cute? <laughs> That's Ever Ready. He was a big poof ball, that boy. He grows a lot of fiber, so he's quite different, but he's a big boy as you could tell. He's just big all the way around. And then we have Thor, 
on his, to the side of him. Yes, he has such a cute haircut. Let's see, behind him on the other side is Star. Now he's one that we did in the shoot rather than on the ground like we typically do for alpacas. And so his cut didn't come out so good. We did him and realized uh, not a good result. So we didn't do the rest of them in the shoot. And then the one in the back is Mocha Joe. And he is so easily mixed up with Latte, who we'll find here in a moment. Okay, so we will pan around. And this guy, see how he's flaring? Yeah, he's hot. This is Andy. He still looks like Andy. And come on over here. It's nearly 100 degrees today, so just to put all this in context, I'm going to come around the side so the lighting is better. But this is Shaman. It turned out pretty good. He looks the same, too. He's just one of those guys. He's going to be the same. So out here, we have Mr. Kino. Let's come around here. Get a good shot. There we go, Kino. Now, Kino is one that I actually had to do twice. Um, well, I did do him the first time. It was one of the early days of shearing, and the shears actually stopped working. So whatever was done on him was done, and most of his neck was not done, and uh, he did not look good at all. So when all of them were finished, him and, oh, Rumchato, I took them back to the barn and I re-sheared him. So Kino actually got sheared twice. And I did that uh, for him and Rum, mostly because there are two guys that the public is going to see more. Kino, he's one that... He's one of the PR alpacas, so I'll take him to petting zoos and places like that. So um, that scraggly haircut that he got first just would not do, and I had to redo him. And this guy here is Maximus. Okay, we'll come around. And this first guy, who's been peeing the whole time I've been filming, <laughs> this is Bear. Now, he turned out quite different because he was... He was one of those that creates so much fiber, so much fiber. Um, so he's feeling a lot better. He was one of the first boys we did because him and Everready, they just get hot early. Oh, and Shaman. We did all those guys, the first of the boys, to be done. This is Latte, and the lighting is not that good. Lighting isn't good. Okay, there's Latte, and he got another bobblehead haircut. So he didn't look a whole lot different than what he did. So he has two years of bobblehead on his head. We'll see how that goes. And of course, looking at these guys, I see areas where I need to fix, but they're just going to be what they are. And this guy was the most transformed of the boys to me. This is Cowboy, and he looks so much different than he did before. But again, still super cute. They all got bobblehead haircuts this year because I was not comfortable shearing really close to their heads. And I left a lot on their legs as well. As you can see, most of them still have a lot of fiber on their legs. And that's um, to help them as they go through tall grasses and weeds, uh, flies, or anything that's going to be bothering their legs. It just helps to protect all that. So this guy right here, Riley. Yeah, poor guy. He's never had a good haircut in his life. This was his second year, and again, I did it. Maybe next year he'll have a nice haircut. And this is Rum, the other guy I told you I had to do twice. Yeah. So, and back there are llamas that did not get sheared this year. We have Roman and Bruno. If the, there we go, the light the exposure will adjust there. So that does it for the boys. I just sprayed down the girls so they're all dispersing out. Here we have Rose. Sorry for the shakiness. She's so pretty. Okay, now let's start over here. This is Cat Sarah. The biggest shock for shearing, I think, is how skinny their neck is or how skinny they are in general. So this white one here is Joy. Let's see if she can show us her pretty face. There's Joy. Behind her is Onyx. 
I know, she must have been a lot darker when she was born for them to call her Onyx, but. And then that is Kiona. Kiona! Look up, show us your face, yes. She looks cute in her bobble head. Here is PJ, my healthy PJ. Yeah? Okay, Joe, you've already met. Okay, the one walking in the background there. Oh, it's hard to see her. That's Lucy. My new llama, Lucy. Yeah, see, some of them are down in the weeds. Well, gosh darn it, I'm not going in the weeds. Okay. Oh, Onyx, you already met. Get there, you already met. Here is Lindsay. Lindsay, show us your face, honey. There she is. Yes. Again, another one that looks so good when she's sheared. Over here we have Jewel. I know, she looks a lot different. And Fanny. Hey, honey, look up. Fanny. There she is. Okay. Okay, the ones who are down there are coming up. And who do we have? That one there, Sharla, next to Lindsay. And we have Bridget, who did not get sheared. Gus, who did not get sheared. Met Tour Dancer. And that's Sonata. All right. Here are the two newest to the herd. We have Mom Val and a two-week-old baby who does not have a name yet. And he is so little. For baby alpaca, he's on the small side. And they only arrived yesterday, so Val doesn't trust me quite yet. We'll just let them walk off. Another new member of the herd since the last podcast is my llama Lucy. She is a Surrey llama, so much different than the classic llamas, which I already have. I think of all the girls, Onyx got the cutest haircut. She's the one in the back behind PJ there. And it's because with her coloring, and the type of bobblehead she ended up with looks like she's a lion with the mane. Let's see if I can get a good shot of her for you. Isn't that so cute? Aren't they just so cute? I think they look so good after shearing. And I remember when I first had alpacas and they got sheared, it was such a, like, a dramatic change that I didn't really like how they looked. They were skinny and awkward looking and it took quite an adjustment. But now after I've been through it so many times, I think it's so beautiful. It's like a relief because you know how they felt in their full fleece as the temperatures got warm. You knew how they would suffer if they kept all that on them. And when they were sheared, you can just tell that they feel so much more comfortable. And if you were to feel a shorn alpaca, it's like velvet. It's soft and it's that little fuzz, you know. It's, it's a happy time for me now. 
because I know that they are happy. And this year was definitely like that. Um, we had April, no, May is when I wanted to share them, but our May was so cold. Our weather this year was weird. May was cold, and then we got into June, it was hot. And we could only shear in the early hours of the morning, and it was just crazy. So it was, it was a relief to get everyone done, not only to just have it done, but because everyone felt so much better, and they're so much happier <laughs> now because of that. But let's get into TV strings and things. This will be the final segment for this episode. And I want to show you what I've been doing for the alpaca cow. And I have got to hurry it up <laughs> to finish what I um, am doing. And initially I wanted to do socks. I really wanted to do socks. In fact, I bought another book in order to do it called Toe Up Two at a Time Socks. And... Um, the author, oh, Melissa Morgan Oaks. Let's get that. Melissa Morgan Oaks. And many of you are familiar with her work because her first book was Two at a Time Socks. This is doing Magic Loop, Two Socks at a Time. Her first book was doing it um, Cuff Down. And I've, I've tried this. I, I like Magic Loop now. And I wanted to try the toe up version, so I bought this book. I did my swatch for the socks because I had some uh, yarn in mind, and it's yarn I have in my store. The label looks like this. <laughs> it was put out by one of the um, American co ops for alpaca. This is the back. Um, they are no longer in operation, but I still have some of the yarn from them. And it was 70% alpaca, 30% merino wool. And I thought this would be great for socks. Did my swatch and realized I did not have the right size needles. Like I don't own the right size needles. So I didn't, I didn't want to buy new needles and do a new swatch and all da da because I live in an area where I can't just go to a local yarn store and buy it and other options I have around here for knitting crochet tools not so great uh, which meant I would have to buy online and I just didn't want to go through all that so I changed the project that I was going to do and decided to do a cowl look at this with cables so cute and of course alpaca cowl is perfect and this is what I have done so far let me get it together for you look at that so awesome I have done a couple of projects with cabling before this one had a lot more cables and I really wanted it to get more experience with cables so you can see I'm doing it in this charcoal gray which is a color I really love and I am super excited like I said I need to get in gear here and uh, finish it <laughs> you know what what I realize I finally understand why people don't get as much knitting and crochet done in the summertime like I understood there was all these like summer activities that you could do and people do so many things like that. But I am not a beach person. I am not a lake person. I typically don't spend a lot of time outside, like by choice. I burn very easily. I was just someone who liked to stay inside, <laughs> out of the sun. That was just me. Um, I get more in the sun now simply because I have livestock and I there are things I have to do outside but I use a lot of sunblock and that type of thing um but what I realized this year is my yard work is what keeps me from knitting and crocheting in the summer I live in a town a little town where I own a block I own a whole block so I have to mow that my studio my fiber studio is also in town I have to mow that I have the ranch. I have to mow that. The air, like the parking area and the driveway and like the parts that the animals are not on. I have to mow. I've spent the last, not the last, but I've spent three evenings 
just mowing my block and the studio because it's all in town on the rider like all the time was just on the rider mower <laughs> and today I still have to go out and do like the trim work the weed whip trim work and next week I need to go out to the ranch and mow so because the weather is so hot you can only do this stuff like in the early morning or in the evening I've been choosing to do in the evening which means my usual knitting spinning crochet time which is the evenings I am mowing so um, I was sitting on the mower yesterday mowing away going I really wish I could be knitting right now <laughs> there is this knitting project this alpaca cowl that I want to get done but so as life I just have to work it in right these are things that we do okay so I showed you all that oh I wanted to talk about spinning I was practicing my spinning okay my spinning wheel is all up and working it's awesome I got it working and I'm going through that craftsy class that I told you about in a previous episode I'll link it down in the show notes um, oh as well as the the pattern for this I'll put that in the show notes too okay so I was doing my practicing at Midsummer Fest in Chicago uh, when it was dead time I was at my wheel practicing and then when I got home I put some dedicated time into practicing as well a bit further more steps further into the class working on that but I'm just still practicing I still have struggles but I'm a newbie spinner so I just have to work it out <laughs> hopefully in a future episode I can show you a bobbin with beautiful yarn on it <laughs> that's my plan anyway <laughs> all right so that will do it for episode 10 thank you so much for joining me today catch me over on social media check in on the Ravelry group if you have any questions or comments like I told you before next week is gonna be about breeding if you have questions that you want to make sure that I cover in next week's next week's episode you can comment on this video down below also remember to like this video that tells YouTube to let other people know about it. That they might be interested in it. And thank you so much for joining me today. I will see you on the next episode.